So, uh, what we did last time was basically a brief overview of the main characteristics of phase transitions and the division into categories, the first order versus second order. Uh, we made a point that the first order transitions are those which are associated with discontinuities of first derivative of thermodynamic potentials. And these transitions, in this way, they are not continuous because basic physical quantities such as uh, magnetization or density undergo jumps, discontinuities. On the other hand, the second order transitions are continuous transitions uh, at which one of the main characteristics, uh, dynamical characteristics, which is the correlation length, diverges, becomes infinite, which means that close to the transition, coming from the disordered phase, you already see the signatures of something new which is going to happen when you reach the critical point. And this something is nothing but the large scale fluctuations of the new phase. The new phase cannot establish itself with some average value of a physical quantity, but it shows up in the way of very, very strong correlations between fluctuations. So if you by fluctuation, by a fluctuation, have some kind of small island of the new phase, it will percolate or very, very large distances. Right? And these are the con continuous transitions, which, as I mentioned, are extremely interesting, <coughs> very rich, and uh, very involved mathematically. And uh, in most cases, so there are a few exactly solvable models for the continuous transitions, of them. and we will cover them, most of them. But in, in most cases, unfortunately, maybe even fortunately, I don't know, the problem is still, there is a still big question mark. For instance, the, the three-dimensionalizing model, as I said, is still not solved. So, yeah. Uh, so the simplest model which we discussed uh, last time was the so-called Azim model. which deals with very simple degrees of freedom. These are scalar quantities taking only two values, plus or minus one. So you introduce uh, at the data size, well, let me change the notation, <coughs> label data size by f, which is the same. Doesn't and the sigma n is a variable associated with each data size which is allowed to take only two values, plus or minus one. So you have to express the energy in terms of these variables. And of course, the simplest thing to do would be to say, OK, I have uh, a set of independent spins. By spins, I mean the Ising spins. Don't be confused. These are not quantum mechanical spins. There's a classical variables. So if I have only this, this is a well-known problem, a classical spin, essentially one half, because now I can turn to, to quantum mechanics, if you wish. If, if I have only this, I can turn to quantum mechanics and say, oh, look, I have a quantum spin, one half. The magnetic field fixes the direction of quantization. And I quantize my spins along the magnetic field, and these will take two values, plus minus one half. Then I will normalize, normalize this plus minus one half by attributing this extra one half to the magnetic field. And I will be left with plus minus one. It's a matter of normalization. It's, it's not a big deal. Right? So therefore, this is a quite a familiar thing if the Hamiltonian is a direct sum of independent terms. The problem is one particle. It's a one spin problem. Everything factorizes. You solve the single spin problem. You assume that your spin is, a, is an 
at equilibrium with the reservoir, huge, huge reservoir, which supplies this single speed system or the speed of system of disconnected spins with the finite and energy due to the exchange. And then you can introduce the notion of the temperature and build up the partition function. And then this way you can calculate. And, and the results you know perfectly well. And we'll recover them in a while. But this is not the, the, the point. The point is just to have something which is much more interesting. This is the notation of a pair of nearest neighbor sites. <coughs> and here is the product, sigma n, sigma n prime. Assuming that j is positive, then in the absence of this term, if I, if I have only interaction between the spins with j positive, I would say the interaction between the spins does support configurations in which all the spins are parallel. And there are two such configurations when all the spins are parallel. Let me denote them by this arrow. I will use this quantum mechanical notation. Don't be confused. This is cat vector. Well, you may <laughs> associate it with some quantum mechanics, but it has nothing to do with that. In fact, it's a, it's a notation. It's a configuration in which all the speeds are up and look upwards, I suppose. That means that the, the, the configuration in which sigma n is equal to plus 1 for all n. And the other possibility is just to have all the spins over turn. This is, this is what the interaction between the, spin, the spins prefers if, if the magnetic field is zero. If the magnetic field is zero. This is the reflection of the so-called Z2 symmetry which takes place, place only in the absence of the external magnetic field, and which tells us that our model, just this model, <coughs> color, this part of the model, is invariant under the simultaneous inversion, sign inversion of all the Ising spins. So here is a, an interesting thing. Already at this level, you can observe something really interesting. So when the magnetic field is not present in the Hamiltonian, this symmetry is intact, which means that the Hamiltonian doesn't change its value, or the energy doesn't change if I take n configuration and then build up a new configuration in which all the spins are overturned. This, so in other words, the configurations come in pair. If I have an energy level, then I have exactly two configurations with the same energy. Well, there may be many more, but the two are guaranteed because they fall from, from this Z2 symmetry. All right. So the Hamiltonian is Z2 invariant. But I'm sorry, the ground state is not. If I choose this state, then this is definitely a minimal energy state. And overturn all the spins, it will not transform to, each, to itself. It transforms to this. So you see, this is the example of the broken symmetry. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah? So if uh, S is equal to zero, if what H? H is equal to zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So, what is the difference between this and that? Because we don't have this and that. Yes, sir. No, no, no. Because we don't have a specific choice for a certain. No, 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 no. Well, the magnetic field. Okay. First of all, I, as I said, I can without any reference to quantum mechanics, I have a well-defined degree of freedom, which I call the Ising spin which takes two values, plus and minus one. The analogy with quantum mechanics is kind of useful thing. You can visualize what, what a spin might be 
if you take a quantum spin one half and assume there is a strong anisotropy which doesn't allow this spin to take other values. But for the spin one half, you don't have anything else but up and down. The choice of up and down means that you have chosen the quantization axis. But this is kind of background which you can invoke if you want to make a connection between classical statistics and quantum mechanics and quantum statistics. Don't do that, please. At the present stage, there is no need to refer to quantum mechanics. We are talking about classical physics. The spins are not real spins. These are variables, discrete variables, taking two values. So therefore, I can discriminate between these, the state in which the spin lo loops upwards and takes values equal to 1, and this one. So it has an absolute meaning. I don't even have to think about anything about it. It's just the definition. Therefore, these two states are perfectly legitimate ground states from better to say, minimal energy states of the Hamilton. But they are not invariant. Each of them is not invariant under Z2 transformation, under the inversion of all the speed. Instead, they transform to each other. You see? Whereas the Hamiltonian, in the absence of the field, is invariant. So the symmetry of the minimal energy state, or we say ground state, is lower than the symmetry of the Hamilton. Is it clear? The same happens in a ferromagnet, by the way. In a, in a isotropic ferromagnet, the energy is fully invariant if you rotate all the spins homogeneously by any angle around any axis. This is full symmetry group, which is called SO3, three-dimensional rotations. But when a ferromagnetism sets in, there is a, some kind of preferred direction along which all the spins want to be aligned, and they do align. And once this happens, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. OK, so we have an example of a spontaneously broken symmetry. Uh, we already said that this is a discrete, this is the case of a discrete symmetry. This is good, because this is the simplest symmetry possible. Because of this symmetry, we have two things. There is, there is a, always an energy gap between any two different levels, between, in particular between the ground state and the minimal energy state and the first excited state. And secondly, as already mentioned, each energy level is twofold degenerate because of it. This is what happens when the magnetic field is absent. When the magnetic field is present, when we switch it off, these two configurations are no longer equivalent. Because the magnetic field want to, wants to polarize all the spins just along the field, not opposite to it. So therefore, this will survive as the minimal energy state for H positive. If H is positive, then the energy will be minimal if all the spins are equal to plus one, not minus one. This will survive. And this will now turn to an excitation. Right? So what you did? You did something very, very essential and very, very important. You have explicitly broken Z2 symmetry. The external magnetic field breaks this symmetry, not spontaneously, as it would happen if, if it were there, but explicitly. Right? So there is an explicit external perturbation applied, external field applied to my physical system, and which enforces the system to show up a property which falls from the, from the fact that the field is applied. The ground state is no longer degenerate. So you remember, in the absence of the magnetic field, both are possible ground states. Both are minimal energy states. Either is this or that one. This is why we can make such a conjecture that perhaps a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry of the symmetry is the same, is the synonym of, of the degeneracy of the ground state. 
degeneracy of the minimal energy state. It has to be degenerate. Right? So, uh, so far, so good. So the question is, how does the, uh, the phase diagram look like when the magnetic field is applied? So here I can measure the magnetic field. And here I will measure the temperature. And here I will measure label fix up somehow. No, no, no. Fix the location of the critical temperature. So this line, this axis, is the axis h is equal to zero. Right. Ever, anywhere else, anywhere else, the magnetic field is not zero. Now, this line, perhaps I have to change the color if there is such a possibility. No, there is no such possibility. This is a line, T less than Tc at h is equal to 0. These two conditions define the location of this line. And this is the line when the symmetry gets from the energy to open, and you have a fairly good ground state. That's precisely what happens. At any non-zero magnetic field, there is no phase transition in the system. You remember what the phase transition was. The phase transition was, if I here measure magnetization, which is the average value of, uh, of the Ising barrel. It should not depend on, on the location of the spin. Yes, I just said, let, let me finish the sentence. I will turn to you. Because of translation of values. If I write down what is the average rate of sigma 1, is the same as sigma 25, for instance. Translation variance tells me on average, at each latest site, I have just the same value of the, of the, of the spin. So if I look at the dependence, perhaps you remember that at, there are two phases. The high temperature phase, the disordered phase, if you wish, in which sigma average is zero. And there is an order phase, and the, the average spin is not zero. The magnetization is zero here, not zero there. And this occurs, everything occurs at this point. Yeah. So the phase transition is a, separates the phases with zero and no zero magnetization. Zero magnetization means that you are, you are in a disordered phase. While the spins chaotically fluctuate and on average give you zero result. Below to see the energetic considerations take over. And the system prefers to have this magnetization non-zero. The good question would be, how does it choose the direction? We will discuss it. Just in a few minutes. You wanted to ask me something. Yes, I thought that H is external to the system. X is, H is I, what? I thought that, that H is external to the system. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And yeah. then what is the essence of floating intermediate temperature? I don't understand this. No, no, no. I thought that you apply it without like. No, no. But you, you, you cannot reconcile the temperature and the magnetic field at, at the same time, or what? Is yeah. it something? How, how does really the H depend? H is, if H is external, you are... Yes. It's, a, it's an absolutely independent variable. It's in your pocket. You can switch it on, switch it off. You can apply any field you want. You want. How, you want. how does it now depend on your temperature? No. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. There are two external parameters on this problem. One is the temperature, which is, it sets in due to the existence of this reservoir. The other is the magnetic field, or a field, let me put it like this, conjugate to this Ising variable, which in the magnetic analogy would be, would be just a, a real true magnetic field. The two have nothing to do with each other. They're completely independent. 
I may have a system at a given temperature at zero field. I may have a system at the any temperature, including zero temperature, in a non-zero non magnetic field. I may have both of the non-zero. Because these are external parameters, not internal, external. Both of them. The temperature is not the internal thing. It measures, it can, in terms of this temperature, you can express the average energy of your system. But the temperature comes from the reservoir. It is not the internal, internal property of your system. Don't you agree with me? It's not quite clear to you. But, well, again, there are quantities there in, in thermodynamics. There are quantities which characterize the internal state, internal thermodynamic state of physical system, measurable state. Now the states are subject to perturbations. The most famous and most kind of familiar perturbation in quartz perturbation is the temperature. Why? Because my system, my physical system is a constant contact with other systems, as a matter of fact, much bigger than, than the system itself. And he's in the process of continuous exchange of energy. This is the way the average energy sets in. And the measure of the set's energy can be retranslated in terms of something which is called the temperature. This is the basic of basics of thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. So therefore, if you remember the partition function which characterizes, it must be sum over all, say, configurations in case of spins or whatever. Here I have the energy as a function of all these configurations divided by the temperature. This quantity describes the system. This is the internal property of the system. This is the external parameter. And this is the basics. This is the how the Boltzmann and Gibbs the hypothesis was, was, was built in, in, into the framework, into the, in the, in the tissue of of the statistical mechanics. All right. So, in this case, in this case, in the absence of external magnetic field, you change the temperature, you vary the temperature, you see the transition. It is absolutely clear that as long as the magnetic field is applied, you will always have a non-zero magnetization because the spins just simply react the magnetic field. So therefore, at any point except this line, at any point, the magnetization is not zero. A conclusion comes immediately. At any age, no zero, you have no phase transitions at all. No continuous phase transitions. Let me put it like this. I will, I will be more accurate, more specific in this point. So the phase transition can only occur at zero temperature. At zero magnetic field. So this is the line where the space transition can occur. Now if you come to this line from above and go and then come to this line from below. The good question is what do I mean by coming from above? Who comes and what comes? I have to say either I measure the magnetization or I simply think in terms of the free energy. What I will find I will find out that in this, this limit and this limit, these two limits do not coincide. This is the line when continuity breaks down. I cannot imagine a jump or discontinuity for the free energy again, because we know that the free energy has to be a continuous function of all the parameters it depends upon. This is one of the basic requirements of this but it doesn't have to be an analytic function. It should be continuous, but not necessarily an analytic function. So therefore, what happens here is some kind of non-analyticity of the free energy, which shows up in the behavior of what? Of magnetization. Let us now turn to the behavior of magnetization. How does it depend on the magnetic field? It depends in, in which phase you are. Now, we hit number one. The temperature is less than Tc. 
is exactly what I what we want to, to discuss. This is h. No, now this time I measure not this h, I'm sorry. This time I'm going to measure the magnetization m as a function as, as average value of, of sigma as a function of magnetic field, assuming that the, the temperature is below to say. So if the magnetic field is applied, the spins will be polarized. And if I decrease the magnetic field, the degree of polarization will decrease. Right? So therefore, I will follow something like this. And then what happens if t less than tc? I will hit this point, stop here. Now the good question is, what would happen if I had started from negative values of magnetic field? Well, I will simply do nearly the same, but then it will hit this axis and stop here. And there is a finite jump. In other words, the magnetic field, the, the, the magnetization as a function of magnetic field. In the limit, when the magnetic field goes to zero, under the condition, the temperature is less than Tc. That's very important. Is M not? Let me call this value M not. Times the signature of the magnetic field. The whole story is about this signature. Because if I count to this point from positive values, the signature is plus 1. If I count from the negative value, the signature of magnetic field, the field is negative, it's minus 1. And therefore, m plus 0 minus m minus 0 is twice a naught. Is now 0. This is the, this is a naught. And this is minus m. What you see, it's a jump. Is this continuity of magnetization? But the magnetization is the first derivative of, of the free energy. Therefore, it's a typical first order transition. So the magnetization undergoes a first order transition, magnetization, as a function of magnetic field if you are in the ordered phase below to see. Right? Now you do the following thing. You start, this happens somewhere here. So, so this is, you go across this line. You just go across this line. Imagine that you measure the magnetization and the magnetization undergoes this discontinuity. But then you start moving to the right. You are approaching the critical point. When you are approaching the critical point, the value of m0 will be replaced by the value of mt, which is less than m0, but still non-zero. So you'll start probing all these points until you hit the critical temperature. At the critical temperature, magnetization, spontaneous magnetization vanishes. And therefore, instead of this, you will have something like this. It will be a continuous line. But with a very peculiar fault. It's a, it, this, this function is not analytic at h equal to 0. Why? Because at t equal to tc, that's a problem that you will be supposed, suggested to, to solve within a, within a week or so. It all follows below 1 over delta. And delta is 1 times the signature of h. And delta is 1 of the so-called critical indices. So delta is less than 1. Oh, excuse me. Delta is greater than 1. 1 over delta is less than 1. 
therefore its derivative here is infinite at this point. And you have a clear non analysis The magnetization is a non analytic function of, of the magnetic field if you are at criticality, at the critical point. It is definitely not if you are below criticality, then it simply undergoes a jump. But when you approach the critical point, it, it recovers its continuity, but still remains non analytic But this is already a signature of a continuous second order transition. But now, if you are a consistent physicist, you may should ask the last question. What happens if you pass through this point and occur in some way? We know what happens here, we know what happens here, we don't know so far what happens there. Then we expect everything to be very, very simple. Why? Uh, because in the disordered phase, everything looks like in the normal phase of any thermodynamically stable substance. What do we know about the spins in the magnetic field? They polarize which, follow, which law they follow. The answer is clear. They're Curie law, of course. So therefore, what you expect to do as will be, you have some kind of deviation from linearity, but here, close to zero, the behavior of your magnetization as a function of magnetic field and the temperature will be something like the linear term susceptibility times the field plus corrections of the third order in magnetic field, which I'm not particularly interested in. These are contribute to the swings of this curve. But here I have a linear dependence, a linear function. When this chi of t is a, some constant divided by temperature, the curve. So here you recover not only continuity, but analyst analyticity as well, because what is written here, it's nothing but the Taylor expansion. Taylor expansion means that the function is analytic. There is no Taylor expansion at this point. Don't be confused. This dependence, where is it? Uh, this dependence. Uh, it's a clear indication that you can't expand. Taylor expanded uh, this function. It cannot be expanded in, in, in the powers of H. H is, is, is non -analytic, analytically dependent on, on some indices. So, this is the uh, overview, the brief overview of the situation with the Ising model, which you can anticipate even before you start, or even try to solve it. You still don't know a lot of things. You don't know much more than you do. But at least at this level, you can make came up with the conclusions which I just displayed to you in a very elementary terms without much mathematics involved. Based basically on physical arguments and logic, nothing else. Right? Do you have any questions? Okay, right. Uh, yeah. So there is a one more lesson we should learn. It's a very important lesson. It has to do with the question, how does the system uh, select the direction of spontaneous breakdown of symmetry? How does it happen? I know that above the sea, uh, the thermodynamically stable phase is disordered. There is no preferred orientation for the magnetization to look at. Therefore, on average, you have zero. You can apply the magnetic field, you will get something like this. You switch off the magnetic field in the paramagnetic field, paramagnetic phase. Nothing remains. You switch off the magnetic field, you push H towards zero. You get zero magnetization. It's, it's all the same whether you do it from the left or from the right. Magnetization disappears. No field, no magnetization. No free lunch, I would say. 
right? So you have to invest to do so. What is that that you are doing, actually, to get a non-trivial result? You go, you, you go across this point. You penetrate into this ordered phase. But then you have, they have this kind of uncertainty. You do know, you do know the system has to be ordered, but there is a Z2 degeneracy of the ground state. How the system will prefer, how it select which, which, which state as the ground state. And here is the trick. This is the resolution. Not this line, but this one, the one which is discontinuous. You switch on a very, very small magnetic field in the ordered field. The magnetization will follow this field. It will polarize along the field. And then you, what you do, you switch off the field. Switch it off. And the polarization remains. If you change the, the rules of the game, you switch on the magnetic field, which is negative. Your polarization will go down. It will be minus. Minus one, right? You keep it like this, and you to switch off the magnetic field, keeping it negative. Your polarization will remain. So you cannot switch off the magnetic field and get zero, like it happens here. You will stop either at this point or at this point, depending on now your question would be, how it happens in reality, in nature? Well, in nature, but there is always at least the magnetic field of Earth, which does the job. Infinitesimally small field does the job. It breaks the symmetry of the system aligns along the some perturbation, which is always possible. But it's a very deep theoretical question, because it's a different kind of response of your system onto external field. The type of response of you, which you observe does tell you in which phase you are, disordered or ordered. Again, in disordered phase, in the disordered phase, you switch on the, the magnetic field, you get magnetization, you switch it off, the magnetization disappears. In the ordered phase, you switch on the magnetic field with the only purpose to enforce the already pre-existing magnetization, spontaneous magnetization, to choose between the two possibilities. Once the choice is done, you switch off the field, and this remains. This is not the magnetic moment induced by this field. This is the magnetic, magnetic moment which has been chosen between the two possibilities by the magnetic field. The magnetic moment itself has been created due to interactions between the spins, not due to the moment. Right. So this is the very delicate thing you have to if you switch on, what happens if you switch on, because you talked about the infinite, infinite small magnetic yeah, yeah, yeah. field that does the job, what happens when you switch on a larger one? And then the second question is like, um, is, the, if, is that small field universal for all systems or it depends on certain properties of the system? No, this, this, field, this field is only required uh, for the only purpose. We will come to that, I hope, today, a little bit later. When I say there are two equally probable configurations, all spins up and all spins down, that means that if I draw a profile of the free energy as a function of, of the function of the magnetization, here I have the free energy, here I measure the magnetization. In the ordered phase, this is what I have. Here I have a knot, and here I have minus a knot. There are two absolutely symmetric minima. For the all the spins up, this point, and all the spins down, this point. What the magnetic field does, it does the following thing. If the field is positive, it pushes this minimum a little bit upwards. And the other minimum a little bit downwards. Now you remove the degeneracy. Then your system will be here, not here, because this energy is lower than this one. 
This is what the magnetic field, that's not a big deal. We are clearly understanding. The magnetic field lifts and degenerates. But what you do then, then, you remove the field. And your system recovers its original shape that you're, 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 you're profiled, but your system is in this way. You see? Imagine, imagine that you have a kind of plate with the two traps. That's a bad figure. So imagine that we have two, two traps for the ball which goes on the surface of, of your plate. It can be either here or there. What do you do? You tilt a little bit. You enforce your ball to drop into this, this one, right? And then you say, okay, let me recover the original horizontal location. It will stay here. You will need to tilt a lot stronger to enforce it to go out. In other words, if, if it was in the beginning in somewhere in some, um, at the center, at the center of, of your plate, it will choose the direction towards the, the one which has lower energy. This is exactly what happens. Now, if the magnetic field was the opposite same, then we see the same effect. Yeah, 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 please, yes. Then you will simply get something like this. That's exactly what the story is about. Okay, so, yeah. So what if we approach the same problem mm -hmm. uh, in this figure? by switching off the magnetic field at T greater than TC and going below TC. Then what about the switch? Because below TC point... Say it again. Where, 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 say, say, it, say it again. Where do I start from? We from? start from... From here? No, sir. From here? No, sir. On that line. On the... On that, on X axis, on T axis, but uh, above TC. Somewhere here? Uh, no, sir. On the yeah. line, line, sir. On the S equal to zero line. No, this is, this is the line, H is equal to zero. Yes, sir. So, okay. So, if we approach... Um, if I have, I'm already on this line, I'm very uncertain. I can't tell you anything. Okay. H is equal to zero. It's a very singular line. Okay, so because this the whole line is the phase transition line. So, it's a, it's a point when everything is extremely singular. The free energy, the magnetization, whatever. I was thinking, like, we start from T greater than TC and... So I advise you not to think in terms of points. Think in terms of histories and lines along which you approach the desired point. You know, when we here at ICTP, for instance, judge about which students are good and which are, excuse me, not, we are not only interested in what grades they receive. We are interested in the history of their progress. Not only the value of the function matters, what is even more important is a derivative. The same story is here. Physics recovers the relationship between humans and societies, if you wish. Kind of small joke, if you want. That's precisely what is needed to be understood. It's not about what is the, what is the value of magnetization at zero magnetic field in the ordered phase Naively, by symmetry, you will say it's zero because this and these are equally probable. But it's not true. Because infinitesimally small but non-zero magnetic field lifts this degeneracy and keeps the problem, keeps the model, keeps the system with the magnetization determined, whose direction is determined by the field, which already doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore, but it did a job, and then it died off, disappeared. That's the point. That's the point. That's the difference between the normal, non-degenerate ground state and degenerate ground state. You live this degenerates. Otherwise, you can't tell the difference. OK, we have to go further. All right. So again, as I said, all this is a very general discussion, which doesn't give you any hint in the slightest, I will say, about how this problem should be solved. The solution is not trivial because it's a many-body problem. It's a many-speed problem. The spins are interacting. Therefore, 
The problem cannot be solved easily. But it's a very old problem, on the other hand. The phase of the problem of phase transition existed always, but this is the beginning of 19th century already, I would say. There were attempts to build up the field. So the, the most ancient, if you wish, and the most famous approach is called mean field theory. What is the mean field theory is about? So you have at some point, so you have a lens, and you are looking at this spin. Suppose we are talking about the Ising spin, right? So let, let it be like this. There is some spin here, and it interacts with its nearest neighbor. So the number of these nearest neighbors is twice d when d is the dimensionality of space. And you can't solve the problem exactly. What you do instead? You can solve the problem if this term is absent. Because it's a one spin problem. So the idea is why don't we try to reduce a problem of interacting spins to an effective approximate problem of a single spin by redefining, say, the magnetic field. In other words, we, apart from the external magnetic field, we have to generate the internal magnetic field. Sometimes it's called the molecular field. Sometimes it's called the self-consistent field, or Weiss field, or Curie-Weiss field. It has been developed in the theory, early theory of magnetism, and the idea is very simple. Instead of taking into consideration the precise interaction of the central spin with all z, its nearest, z neighbor, nearest neighbors, I can try to describe the effect of the surrounding spins on average by introducing some extra magnetic field. But if I simply replace it by an extra magnetic field, it would not be enough. This magnetic field must itself depend on the average magnetization. The idea is something like this, right? So therefore, I will, in this way, reduce the, try to reduce the problem to, to the very simple one spin problem, plus the self-consistency condition, which I need, would need to take into account, because of the fact that the field is not an external one, it's an internal or molecular field, which itself depends on magnetization. So I would, in this way, we'll get some kind of transcendental equation, which I will have to solve. But before we return to this problem, let us forget. Let us set j equal to 0. The magnetic field, excuse me, the Hamiltonian turns out to be a direct sum of elementary Hamiltonians. The partition function, therefore, turns out to be a, equal to a partition function on a single spin. And all this in powers of n, when the n is total number of spins in the system. When z1 is what? It's the sum over sigma, which takes j plus minus 1, an exponent. energy of a single spin as a function of sigma. Now let me introduce, yeah, so let me introduce this beta, which is 1 over temperature. So therefore, it is sum over sigma plus minus 1. This exponent, this beta, this h, and sigma. And therefore, it is twice hyperbolic cosine beta h. Beta h. This is how the partition function of a single spin in the magnetic field looks like. Now, according to the general, okay, now you can proceed in many ways. You can, differ, you can build up the free energy, differentiate the free energy, and calculate the magnetization. Fantastic, very good. 
You can do otherwise. You can you remember that the average value of a spin should be what? Here I should write down sigma beta h sigma divided by normalization, which is nothing but the partition function sigma. Right? V h sigma. Here instead of cosh, instead of hyperbolic cosine, I will get a sign because of the sigma. So altogether, I will end up with hyperbolic tangent of h divided by h. This is how the average magnetization m as a function of the field. And the temperature looks like so. If I draw m as a function of h at a given temperature t, which is now 0, what I will find these are asymptotes plus and minus 1. And this is the typical plot of a hyperbolic tangent. At large values of its argument, it goes to the limits, asymptotes plus or minus 1, depending on the sign. At small values of its argument, it's a linear function. So therefore, if the magnetic field is much less than t, then my magnetization M is the susceptibility times the magnetic field, where the susceptibility is 1 over 2. The Curie law, of course. What else? But the Curie law. So this is how we solve the problem of isolated spinners. The very fact that there, is a, there are deviations from this follow from the fact that in the magnetic field becomes very large as the temperature as a function of the temperature, then the magnetic field aligns the spins along the field, and it's very, very hard to further excite the spin at all because it's already has hit the ceiling. There is no room for extra increase of the spin. So this is why everything gets saturated here and here the most susceptible part of the story is somewhere here, in the opposite limit. But the magnetic field is small as compared to the thermal energy. So we want to reduce something to this one. How to switch on now to this interaction and try to reduce the complicated problem to something like this? It's being done as follows. First of all, I have to separate for each variable. I have to separate the average value of the speed, m is the average value of the speed. Please notice that the average value of the speed does not depend on m. Due to translational invariance, it doesn't matter where I measure. Right? Plus fluctuations. Delta sigma n, when delta sigma n, by definition, is sigma n minus n, which is the same as sigma n minus n. It's fluctuation. Now, the mean field approximation is an approximation which, in this form, it concentrates basically on the first term. And also basically ignores fluctuations, basically. Not completely, but basically. I'll explain to you what it meant by this. But I know, of course, I know that you already, you already are aware of all this. Let me do all these very simple calculations. So, uh, uh, as, as before, we know that this double sum of anything should be replaced by summation over lattice sides and summation over the nearest neighbors j. We have already discussed it last time, right? Yes, we did. Uh, now what comes out from all this is the following structure. So the Hamiltonian in the mean field approximation transforms to, to the following form. It is minus j 
the sum over n and prime. There will be the m squared term, of course. There will be two cross terms, m times fluctuations of this, and from here, m times fluctuations of this, because of the simple interchange of n and prime, I can write down twice m and delta sigma n. And then there will be a term which looks like delta sigma n, delta sigma n prime. And of course, there will be also a term. For the magnetic field, there is no need to separate the average value and its fluctuations because it's a one spin or one particle term. So therefore, I will write it down like this. What is this? This is the contribution to, to the minimum energy state, to the ground state energy. All the spins are polarized because if I, if I throw out all fluctuations, I will be left only with this one. But I cannot throw out all fluctuations. Some of them in the lowest order, which are present here, must be kept. What I can and what I should ignore is just this term. This is the interaction between fluctuations. In other words, if I overturn one, one spin, the probability for, for the second, for the nearby spin, nearest neighbor spin, to look in the same direction should be more than 50% due to this correlation, right? Because there is a tendency towards ferromagnetic order. If the spins were decoupled, whatever happens to the first spin, the second can fluctuate in any way. But because of the interaction, because of the correlation, this, uh, what this effect is ignored. The mean field theory ignores it. Right? Now, if you drop this term and recall that what is written here is twice m sigma n minus n, after some very simple manipulations, you will arrive and the following result, your Hamiltonian in the midfield approximation is plus j divided by 2 and z m squared minus effective magnetic field, effective magnetic field, which has two, com two contributions, the external magnetic field and the molecular field or device field, which depends on the average value of the space. Right. So your magnetic field became a function of something you want to calculate. It's a strange thing which happened, right? So it's a great insight, by the way. Today we are, we are so accustomed to midfield approaches that we don't even appreciate the, the beauty and importance of this insight. You want to calculate something. The classical mechanics or quantum mechanics doesn't matter what says the following, you have to have a reason for a particle, for a particle to change its location, to, to change its momentum, and things like that. So in other words, we're talking about forces, we're talking about interactions, potentials, and things like this. We want to measure something as a response to given external perturbations. But in this approach, this external perturbation, apart from the term which is purely external, also contains information about the internal state. So it's not completely an external field. This is why it's called the self-consistent field or molecular field. It does contain information about the inner state of, the, of matter. Right? But now everything's fine. This is just a constant. And this is precisely the story about non-interacting spins. But the field, the magnetic field, is not complicated. So you have to solve this problem, which is already, we have already solved it. This is the solution. But instead of H, we should substitute this one. Now, before we go, we should discuss, OK, do we have any feeling when such approximation, such approximation 
can be valid, can be good. How do you, what do you think about it? Or what do you know about it? I just uh, like uh, to have this approximation, mm -hmm. we need to like have a kind of validity for M. So M has to be kind of properly defined. So right. larger the Let's say, like, if I am surrounded by more people, the M uh -huh. will be more stronger. Uh -huh. In that case, so, so you you are in favor of increasing the number of nearest neighbors, as far as I can see, right? Yes. You are right, by the way. But you remember? You, you, do you see? The, you remember the all this number of nearest neighbor? Oh, I remember everything. How the number of nearest neighbors depends on the dimensionality of space for a hypercubic radius. Conclusion. So, if I have a model in which a given spin interacts with many neighboring spins, in other words, if I have a lattice in which the number of nearest neighbors is sufficiently large, then I have all expectations, all the reasons to expect that midfield should not be too bad. I cannot say it would be good because I don't know if it's good, where it should be good and where it should not. But it should be good enough. Why? Again, because the larger is the number of spins involved in the radius of interaction, the lower is the fluctuation of this number fluctuation of the effective spin which is associated with this. Because in large systems, when the number of involved particles is n, relative fluctuations go like this. This is one of the statements of you, It follows from Poisson statistics. You can check it in the standard courses of statistical physics. So the larger number of particles, the larger configura if configuration number z, the smaller are fluctuations of, of the molecular field, the better it is defined. So therefore, we expect that if I, have, if I had a magnet with such a structure that the number of nearest neighbor is sufficiently large, it can be, theoretically, it can be achieved even for a hypercubic lattice, but in large enough dimensions, it's a theoretical model, but not a realistic model. So in other words, the Ising models in higher dimensions should follow the mean field approach. Uh, so you know, just, just a second, you know what is the critical, upper critical dimension will be right? Four. It's four, that's right. It's four. You know what followed when it was discovered? It has been discovered at one place, another person got a Nobel Prize. Kenneth Wilson, I'm not saying that anything bad about Ken Wilson. Ken Wilson was one of the greatest scientists. But the idea belongs to Mr. Larkin and his, his disciple, Kmelecki in Russia. They, they, they derived the, 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 the theorem, they, they proved the theorem that the dimensions if d equal to 4 in height, fluctuations play, that don't play an important role, but instead of writing paper on that, put all the stuff into appendix. Can you imagine when you are holding a jewel in your hand and throwing it into, into, into you know, a garbage bin? And then so get your surprise that you were not acknowledged, you were not noticed by the community. That's exactly what happened. Life is very tough, people, I must tell you. I must tell you as a, as a secret that I did talk to the person involved in this discovery. And he said we couldn't, couldn't behave in any other way. That was the only way which was allowed at our institute. But I don't want to discuss that. Oh. Yeah, it's four. It's four. In higher dimensions, it's, it's midfield. But in three, it is not. It is definitely not in two and absolutely wrong in one. Because in one dimension there are no phase transitions at all. At any temperature. Due to the famous theory. Yeah, so 
Any any questions here? Yeah. So to increase Z, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can we uh, like not depend upon the dimension, but increase the number of bases to increase the? Yeah, it's possible, but it's hard to you know. Yeah. It is possible, right? Right. So what? Let let me let me give an example. We are lucky. Uh, in physics and in reality, there is a system which follows what you suggest perfectly well. Do you know what is that? It has nothing to do with magnetism. It's a superconductor. In a superconductor, superconductivity follows from, from the fact that electrons moving with opposite momenta and having opposite spins form bound states called Cooper pairs. A Cooper pair constitutes Cooper pairs constitute bosons, and then as bosons, they undergo Bose condensation and go to the, to the background, just condense, right? So, so there is a condensate of Cooper pairs. Now the good question is, what is the typical size of this bone state? Don't forget that the, in metals, the wavelength is of the same order as the distance between the particles and is, is of the order of 10 to minus 8 centimeters. The radius of a Cooper pair is called the, the coherent length, which we will say correlation length, if you wish. I will put this, I know. It's not the one close to the transition which diverges, but it's the one which characterizes kind of cat correlations away from that one. And this is of the order 10 to minus 4. And therefore, it is much, much greater than the De Broglie wavelength of a single electron. So if you have electrons in a matter, you take this electron, it makes a Cooper pair with some other electron which is miles away. And in between, you have electrons. How, do, how can this pair be stable in such a mess? And the answer is, this, be, this is because pairing doesn't occur in, in standard superconductors. The pairing does not occur in real space. The pairing occurs only in momentum space. Only in momentum space, I can distinguish between Cooper, different Cooper. In real space, there is a superposition of all of them. But the size of a Cooper's, Cooper's, Cooper pair is still this. And you can understand how many particles are inside this bubble, whose linear size is this, and when the, the number of particles inside it will be 10 to the power of 4 by per cubic centimeters or whatever. So you have this effectively Z, as you mentioned, huge. So this is exactly the explanation why the main, the main field solution, the main field treatment of a superconductor, or the basic, or the, or the famous theory, BCS theory, Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer theory, microscopic theory, is essentially an in field theory. The fluctuations, if you don't take special measures, fluctuations are extremely weak. That's an example. A system. In magnetic systems, it, it's not like this. In three-dimensional case, even if you consider fancy structures with apparently large number of nearest neighbors or something like nearest neighbors, it still doesn't work very well. You will find the range of applicability, but you will not be able to approach directly the critical point. Then you will need a different theory. The scanning, it's, it's important. Right? Okay. So, the rest is very simple. The rest is extremely simple. I will use this formula. I will simply write down that magnetization is hyperbolic tangent of beta. Here I should write down this one H plus J. Z and M. So let us set 
h equal to 0. No external fit. We know that this is just the one of the requirements for the take phase transition to take place. We well, already know that in the presence of a magnetic field, there is no continuous phase transition. So we set the magnetic field equal to 0. Now we have a parameter of beta, j, and z. Let us call it gamma. So I have m is equal to hyperbolic tangent, gamma m. Next step, I will introduce x, which is gamma m. Then the equation looks like x divided by gamma is equal to hyperbolic tangent of x. It's a transcendental equation, but it's a bit very transparent and convincing graphical solution. <coughs> so what I have to do, I have to draw two functions, this and that, on this graph. Here is x, here is this function. In one case, this is x divided by gamma. In the other case, it's hyperbolic tangent. Let me start with the hyperbolic tangent. This is 1. This is correspondingly minus 1. And the hyperbolic tangent has the property that it starts with the angle 45 degrees. It crosses. It's a straight line. at small x. At small x, tangent x is the same as x. Therefore, it's 45 degrees, and then it deviates and saturates here, and saturates here. This is the plot for this function. Now, here I have not a single function, but a whole family of functions, because they differ in the in gamma. So, if gamma is less than 1, then 1 over gamma is greater than 1. And therefore, it is a straight line which intersects the hyperbolic tangent only at one point. That's equal to zero. This is the case of gamma less than one. But if gamma is greater than one, then I have something like this. I have still, I still have as x equals 0 as a solution. But on top of it, I have two more solutions, this and this. I think I did that. It's not a minus x not. They are symmetric, you could be obvious symmetric. So, and this is the case gamma greater. So gamma is equal to 1 is a special point because it's unstable. If it is less than 1, then this survives as the only solution. If it's greater than 1, two nearby solutions emerge and they start moving apart at some finite gamma data. I have three of them. A little bit later, we'll make sure then in this case, this is indeed corresponds to a, in, to a true minimum of the free energy. So this is a, a stable, thermodynamically stable state. Gamma less than 1. Let me change the notations and say that gamma is equal to 1 means, according to these notations, that beta, the temperature, is equal to Jz. And this I will call Tc. This is the Curie temperature. J times Z. So, gamma less than 1 means that the temperature is greater than Tc. Therefore, we are already well educated to understand that in the disordered phase, in the disordered phase, I have only one solution of the self consistency equation, which describes a phase with zero, zero magnetization in the absence of a magnetic field, of course. Right? But 
If I go to the other limit, to the other regime, when gamma is greater than 1, which means the temperature is less than Tc, then on top of the zero magnetization, I have two other solutions. We will show just in a while that in the first case, above Tc, the dependence of the free energy on magnetization at small magnetization looks like this. It's a standard minimum at m equal to zero. And this is what concerns the, the case T greater than Tc. When T is less than Tc, then we have this curve. We do have a solution at m equal to zero. But it corresponds not to the minimum, but to a maximum. So this point, it doesn't disappear. It does exist, but it is not, does not describe a stable state of matter. It's an equilibrium, but extremely unstable. Well, it's not an equilibrium. It's, it's an it's a equilibrium like Latin pendulum. You know, the pendulum which is in the vertical position. A little, just... You push a little bit, and it immediately goes away. Whereas these are just two symmetric solutions, n and not, and minus and not. Of course, these solutions are de depend on, on the temperature. And effectively, when the temperature becomes very, very small, in other words, when gamma goes to infinity, you go to the saturation, which corresponds to all spins up or all spins down? Yes, some you were going to ask me something. No, you didn't. Okay. You, you were not. Excuse me. Right. So that's the uh, formal solution of this equation. Now, what you can do, you can switch on, switch on the, the field. It will be not as, as beautiful, as elegant as it appears now, but you will make sure. Uh, you, you will see how this. Z2 symmetry gets broken by the magnetic field. All the solutions will start depending on the field and field levels. So, uh, uh, what you can do, you can, of course, easily calculate within the mid field approximation the free energy. I leave it to you as an exercise. And you will make sure that if you simply find out the dependence of the free energy. The free energy is defined as the total free energy divided by the particle number. It's a function of it's a function of m and all the other parameters. m is just this one. Uh, and then you, you demand that the f the m is zero. Right? So and you immediately arrive at this equation. Which is trivial because, as I said, you either you can you will, you will uh, calculate your magnetization by minimizing the free energy, or you simply use the standard rules of statistical mechanics. The result should be just the same. Uh, and uh, if you do everything correctly, this is the most important part. You may ask yourself, how does this free energy as a function of magnetization look like? How does it look like when the, you are close enough to phase transition? In other words, now you introduce a very, very important quantity in that theory. It's T minus Tc by Tc. So you will assume now that absolute value of tau is much less than one. That's precisely what we mean when we say we are close to the phase transition. If this condition is obeyed, then you can show that your free energy, free energy density, defined like this, free energy per atom, per spin, as a function of m, this is f naught, its value at zero field, which is not terribly impressive and important. And then we have an expansion, which looks like this. It's 1 half a m squared plus 1 quarter b m to the fourth plus so forth and minus h times m. 
Well, A is T C by O and B is one third of T C. What is written here is, of course, it's a simple, it's a very simple thing. You do calculation here. You know how to calculate the partition function using mean field approximation. You have the z, and then you build up the log z, right, minus temperature. That's exactly how the free energy is defined in statistical physics. You divide it by the number of speeds and calculate the small m. And then expand everything in, 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 uh, in powers of m. You observe several important this expansion, by the way, is called the Landau expansion because it's a Landau theory of phase transitions, which is concentrated, is focused on, on the vicinity of this phase transition. It doesn't have any intention to cover regions of far away from this point. But you have derived it, so you can, you can derive it for yourself. And you, in this way, you simply make sure that Landau theory is nothing but the mean field theory just to put the complicated things into, a, into simple words. It's an infield thing to nothing else. Now, the interesting thing, the most interesting thing, the most interesting thing with this expression is that you have derived it. And it shows you that your free energy is a perfectly analytic function of magnetization. Don't forget it. We have defined the second order or continuous phase transition as a transition into a state such that at criticality, at the critical point, the free energy displays an essential singularity. What you observe here? A perfectly analytical function. It's a Taylor expression. So where does this non-analyticity come from? Good question, right? Highly material. In other words, the non-analyticity which is accumulated at the critical point is by no means determined by any kind of non-analyticity in the expansion of the free energy uh, as a function of the, of, of the magnetization. It's a consequence of completely different physics using this already at the mean field level. This is a mean field. This is a mean field free energy, which is the same as one energy. At this level, you can do all the calculations which are possible. The only thing which may be lost and is lost is spatial correlations between, between the magnetization of different points of space. Here, everything depends on M. And M is a global magnetization per unit particle. That means that you consider only uniform states of, of, of your system. You, you consider states with different values of this magnetization. And the probability of, of a state, the probability of a state with a given magnetization is proportional exponent minus beta times this free energy. As a function of magnetization, on the free energy is just number of particles times the same. And then you find out the most probable distribution. And therefore, once you have the definition of the probability, you can calculate any physical force, including magnetization, its derivative with respect to magnetic field, whatever. And there you find non analyticities as a function of power. That's, the, that's a very important moment in all the story. It doesn't have to do with the fact that these coefficients are singular as a function of tau. You see, they're not. A is simply proportional to tau, and B doesn't depend at all. On the other hand, if you calculate now, now at the critical point, T equal to Tc, the magnetization as a function of magnetic field, you will find out 
No more, no less. What eight? This critical exponent will be eight delta. Because, and this is one of the problems you are supposed to solve. So there is something behind it. There is something, something very deep. And what is most important in all this story that all the singularities we are talking about are essentially dependent on the singularities of a single physical quantity. And you can easily imagine what this quantity might be. Of course, it's a correlation. It's the correlation. Because it's a measure of the distance from the, from the, from the phase transition point to any non-critical state, non-critical So uh, therefore, uh, in the scaling theory of phase transition, you'll find out that there are some basic uh, inputs uh, which determine basic quantities, which determine in, term, in terms uh, in turn, they determine uh, the behavior of, this, of, the, of the correlation length. And then you can show, you can understand why it is precisely the correlation length uh, which, whose divergency determines the, the whole normality of the free energy as a function of time. So I would like to more make a warning. When we are talking about non analyticity so the free energy at the phase transition, we assume the following. I have this expression. It's very important, by the way. Please uh, try to understand it as much as you can. This is an expression for the free energy of a non-equilibrium state of the system. Why non-equilibrium? Because this is a state with the given value of m at a given temperature, which goes comes from here, close to the close to transition and the given value of magnetic field. Because this expression gives me the probability for my system to have this or that value of magnetization. So therefore, when, cal when I calculate some quantity which depends on M, including M itself, I should calculate it by integrating over all values, over all values of what M for this probability. But there is another point of view. We know that from statistical physics, from classical statistical physics, that the equilibrium value, equilibrium configurations of the fields are dependent, are determined from the minimal action principle. In this case, we would say, I have to look at the minima, allowed minima of the free energy as a function of Otherwise saying, I have to minimize this free energy with respect to M, find out this M, and then decide what to do. The M will be some function of tau and magnetic field. And then I will plug that solution into this expression. It will no longer depend on M. It will only depend on tau, on the distance from the critical point, and external magnetic field. The claim is that it is that very expression for the free energy, which is non-analytic as a function of tau and as a function of magnetic field. But as a function of the original order parameter, M is the order parameter because it classifies you to different states of matter, dissolved state and ordered state. As a function of M, it is perfectly analytical function. So non-analyticity is by no means determined by some tricky things, fancy things associated with these coefficients. These are the standard coefficients of a tenor experiment. Instead, it's a miracle that even solving at the classical level, you find out the behavior which, being substituted, inserted into this expression, assuming that everything is done at equilibrium, does reproduce non uh of the free energy and consequently in all, in all the rest. Now, I was going to, to, to give you specific problems, but I perhaps will behave a little bit differently. Now I can switch it off. 
Do I correctly switch it out? Just push it. The black one. 